There are some cool things that Microsoft does um, that you can now benefit from. So WSL is the best way to use them both simultaneously. And you are probably in a world where you need to use them both simultaneously. Uh, Linux is everywhere. If you're using the cloud, Linux is there. So many websites run on Linux at the end of the day. If you're using open source software, like I'm sure all of you are, you are using Linux. And uh, you need to be able to use those tools, kind of whatever environment you're on. So let's take a case study. These are two customer stories who are real customers we chatted to saying, hey, this is why we use WSL. Uh, EA and Blizzard. You'll notice they're both gaming companies, and because they're gaming companies, they primarily ran the Windows operating system for all of their developers. So why are they WSL stories? Because when these gaming companies started making their online servers, they used Linux. But the challenge they had was all of their developers at their enterprise were using Windows and weren't familiar with Linux, didn't want to spin up a Linux box because they're so used to using Windows and their day-to-day -day is Windows. So the great thing about having the power of WSL on their machine is that they were able to get access to real Linux, real Linux instances, real Ubuntu, and they were able to do their work, which in this case was debugging stack dumps from uh, networking servers that were doing things like hosting games for the Frostbite engine powering Battlefield 4, for example. And so this isn't a unique story. There are tons of customers all over the world who have this experience. They need, they're coming from a Windows world. They want to start using Linux, and this is a great avenue for them. So why? Why would they use WSL? What does it actually mean to use both? Uh, I just want to highlight some of the features. There's some on the slides, but I also want to show you a demo of what it looks like real life. So the first feature is you can easily access files from both. I'm going to quit out of the slides so we can watch it live in a demo. And I'm going to do probably the most ill-advised thing and do a demo using conference Wi-Fi. And uh, I'm going to show you a new project that Microsoft has done called Microsoft DevBox. This is a cloud developer box all right, that's targeted to the Windows OS. So at first you might go, okay, that's nice, but how does it apply to Linux? And the cool part is this allows companies to deploy a secure machine that they have whatever they want set up on it before, and we made sure on the WSL team that this works really well with Linux workflows. So here's my dev box, and I actually use this when I travel, like right now, and when I go and open it up, you can see I have my own developer box. This is in my browser directly. And I have PowerShell here. And where it gets really cool is if I go here, I have Ubuntu as an option. And so Linux is built directly into the new Windows Terminal experience. And the Windows Terminal is open source as well, by the way. And when I go and click this, there we go. Excuse me while I'm doing this one-handed while holding a mic. But when I go ahead and click this, we have an experience where I get the Ubuntu shell right away. So in just a couple of seconds, it opens up, and then I have access to my shell. And we've also worked with the Ubuntu team to make sure that this looks really nice um, with the Ubuntu colors, like you can see here. And so I can't make it bigger, but that's OK. We'll go into settings and make it more accessible. I'll just zoom in. And so from the shell, I can do whatever I would want normally. So I can do sudo apt update. Um, I can go and open projects. And I can run my normal Linux workflows that I would here. But where it's really different is the level of integration between Windows and Linux. Like This is different than a VM or a traditional VM in the sense that I can go to CD mount C and access my C drive this way. So if you didn't catch that, I'm now in my Windows C drive. And I can access all of my Linux files, can access all of my Windows files. And I can even do that in the opposite direction. So I can go vice versa, and I can run PowerShell.exe. So I'm running a Windows executable. And then I can do give it the command slash C, which is just, hey, here's a command. And I'm going to run start dot from here. And so I've said, hey, run PowerShell.exe and run the start command. And you can see now I've opened up PowerShell to my C drive from within the bash shell, which is a strange thing, to say the least. Um, it gets even weirder, because I can go to my home file 
or my home folder inside of Linux, and I can do the same thing, powershell.exe slash start, and I opened up my home folder in Linux from within Windows File Explorer, which is strange, but cool. And uh, where it gets cool as well for this audience is let's say I wanted to do something like, hey, I actually don't like File Explorer that much. I much prefer something like Nautilus. And so I can install that. Aha, uh -huh. I need an install there. But I can go ahead and install that, and then I can run that file explorer if I want. Oh, haha, -ha, typing while talking on a demo. But I can go ahead and install this, and then run this simultaneously, and I can use this as my file explorer if I so choose, because this also supports GUI applications. And I can show you exactly what that looks like. And so what we've done in the end of the day, our goal is to make the environments as close as possible. We want to make it all feel like one machine, and we want to have a kind of melding of the worlds. And we've actually done this in practice as well with partnering with Canonical. We shipped uh, with, with HP preloaded laptops that had Ubuntu preloaded on them with WSL on top of Windows targeted towards data scientists. So in a lot of ways, this is from, from an Ubuntu perspective, kind of making your work and all of your contributions available to a wider audience uh, of people in a, in a really cool and interesting way. So Nautilus has finished being installed, and I'm going to go ahead and run that. And then I get Linux File Explorer right here, running as a Windows application. And I can even go in through here, uh, go to my root. I can go to mount. And I can go to my C drive on Windows, which is very weird, from Nautilus. And so that's the kind of goal, is to bring these together to make, hey, you, whatever tools you want to use, wherever you want to use them, we want to empower you to make that possible. Um, so that's jumping back to my slides. That's out of the demo. And uh, these are just showing the highlights of those features. So I. That's what I showed you really quickly as a demo. But you can do other things like open notepad.exe to open Linux files. You can do a whole lot more. You can pipe commands from across different distros. Um, and essentially, we want you to be able to run anything you want from anywhere with interrupt. The other things that are a little bit harder to show you right now, but I'll show you in GIF form, you can actually leverage your Windows GPU as well. So if you're doing data science or machine learning workflows, you can access your Windows GPU straight from it which is a pretty big differentiator uh, from other virtual, virtualized environments. So in this example, I have a Python file where I'm running TensorFlow. I go and run that, and I have that is running in a Docker container in Linux. And then I'm showing Task Manager on Windows to show, yes, I'm actually stressing the GPU on my machine. And then GUI app support. So I showed you a really quick one of, hey, here's Nautilus running. But there's a whole lot more that you can do with it. and so. The GIF on the screen is here I am running the Ross Robotics Suite, which there's a talk later today about. Uh, I'm running that on WSL to simulate a very cool, intrepid robot exploring a simulated cave um, through the Windows subsystem for Linux. So how does it actually all work? What did we do behind the scenes? What horrible magic did we do to make this possible? Um, essentially, we used a lightweight Linux utility VM. And so what's very cool about WSL and what's cool about it being part of Microsoft is that we can take advantage of a lot of other projects that Microsoft is doing. So this concept of this lightweight VM actually came from Azure because they need to spin up a lot of VMs very quickly and shut them down very quickly. And so we are able to spin up that VM and start system D, like what you saw today, from cold in about five seconds. So that time that we were waiting for to get to shell was actually starting from cold, uh, from no resources being taken up on the machine. And we load into that our real Linux kernel that's built and, and serviced by Microsoft. And on top of that, we load the GNU Linux user mode piece pieces. So these are shipped by the distros themselves. Uh, and that's where Ubuntu and Canonical come in. You ship the distro that lives on top that people interact with. We're just the platform layer at the bottom. So we're all a technical audience. I want to do a deep dive into what we're actually doing, what parts are where, uh, you know, to dive deep into it from the high level. 
you run wsl.exe to start WSL. That calls into our own service, which is a Windows service. We call into the host compute service, which is what Windows uses to start up virtual machines and manage them. We say to the host compute service, hey, please give me a VM. Here's my Linux kernel. And then we, we load from the LXSS manager service, we load in your distro by loading a VHD file directly into it. And then from there, all of the binaries that run inside of the distro, they can talk back to WSL.exe using bin format. And that's how we do interop. And then we have file servers working as a VM worker over in Windows and one in Linux to share files between the two environments. And uh, the last part, 9B protocol, this is how we do interop. The last part that's key here is multiple distros. They all run in the same VM separated by namespaces, just like you would with containers. So that's the, how we do the basics. And then how did we do GUI apps? How was that possible? And to go back to it, just to, to highlight some of the cool GUI features of GUI apps, um, let's start it again. When I started this, there's no bar at the top besides the GTK bar and tooling. If I go to any window here, like help, okay, that's denied. Let's try about, there we go. Any new window comes up as its own window, and this is subtle but cool. Windows has its own drop shadow, right, on the back of Windows applied. That is being applied here, so this is a real Windows window being shown with a full Linux app, and, and everything from it is Linux. You can see this is actually full uh, Linux interface. What are we doing here? How is this possible? Um, and just to, just to really have fun, let's, let's actually install um, a snap. Once I can try and kill this, there we go. Let's do sudo snap install Spotify, and then we'll run that. Um, just to see what um, another app might look like. And so I'm gonna go ahead and use snap, install Spotify, and then we'll run that because multiple apps can run on this. You can run anything that you would here. And so we'll do sudo Spotify. And then we get access to our Spotify window. So here we are, we have Spotify. And you'll notice the Linux tiling here at the top. So this is true Linux. Everything here is running as Linux. And if I go to Alt-Tab, uh, you can see that it's also running here as, you can see it as a Linux um, thing, as a Linux window. So it's very integrated with the Windows operating system. How do we make that possible? This is how. We, so here's the architecture. Now take that, that Linux part and put it over to the right. Yes, you're right. And uh, consider it just as a VM, of running Linux in a VM. And then we're gonna abstract it. So pretend, hey, we just have a Linux VM with Ubuntu running in it. What we did is we created a, a companion distro to it. We call it the system distro. This is just a very lightweight distro actually running Mariner, which is a, a Linux distribution built by Microsoft. And we put a Wayland server inside of that. So every time you start up your Ubuntu distro, we start up this Wayland server as well. And when you run a GUI app, so you run something like Nautilus, what happens is it talks to that Wayland server to say, hey, give me connection to everything GUI. That Wayland server then talks over an RDP connection, so a Hyper-V socket, over to mstsc.exe. And so that is the remote desktop application. And so what's cool is, hey, we're reusing all these parts from Microsoft to stitch together an experience where I can have, you know, Outlook or Photoshop or whatever I want running there, and then I can have Nautilus or any other GUI app I want running simultaneously through the power of the remote desktop connection, which is also something that Microsoft is investing in, and any benefits that will happen to remote desktop will also be applied to running Linux GUI apps, which is really quite cool. And so each distro that you would run in WSL, the WSL environment, has its own Wayland server implementation. These all talk over to mstsc.exe. And then so they all run simultaneously because they can all work together. Okay, I mentioned we're technical, so we're gonna do another deep dive because it's fun and look at what exactly is 
going on. Like, I want actually the details of what is happening inside of that Wayland box that you drew. Here are the details. We run Weston, and inside of that, we have a rail shell talking to uh, a native Wayland app over in your distro, over a Wayland socket. And then we also have an X Wayland server there as well. So we do support X apps, and that can talk over to any generic X11 app you want. They all talk to the Weston compositor. And then we have a Pulse audio server existing there as well because it supports audio. And you can even use your microphone on it as well. So we, we would test it when we first developed it by using uh, doing all our team calls within the Linux version of Teams. And uh, that uses an RDP sync to go talk to Weston. And we then talk over free RDP to mstsc.exe. So there's been a lot of contributions uh, to and from Linux to make this possible. Uh, from Weston to everything, uh, to Ubuntu, to the whole stack, to make this something that's possible inside of WSL. So that's the overview of what is WSL, why would someone want to use it. And because we have a deep dive today, I want to show you some more advanced features of cool things that we've added, some cool ways to use it in a workflow. And uh, after this, I'll also be highlighting what we're doing next, so our upcoming roadmap. So recent additions. We actually recently added the ability to run systemd inside of WSL, uh, out of, directly out of box support. And so I, saw, I showed that indirectly by running snap, as you just saw. And huge thanks to Canonical for partnering to make this possible, and to the community, community members like you, uh, and other folks like Danny as well, who presented this morning, uh, who actually made this possible by contributing a lot uh, to, to this implementation. And so systemd now works. We also want to make updates faster to WSL. Up until this point, if you went and took a really critical eye, you would have noticed that the architecture slide I just shown, I just showed, had uh, everything was inside of the Windows image itself, which uh, is great, but also has its own challenges because you have to update Windows every time you want to update the Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, that is challenging in of itself because it's not a, always so easy to update Windows to the latest version. So what we did is we pulled everything out from the Windows image and we put it all into the Microsoft Store. And so this means your updates for any new fun stuff in WSL, like GUI apps, like systemd support, and more, will go from getting it in the order of years from when we develop it to months, order of months. So instead of like two years later, you'll get it two or three months later, which is a really huge improvement, quality of life improvement. Um, as well, we want to improve the WSL install process, and so we're improving that to make that compatible with the store. And with the store version, we've had a whole other host of improvements for running your own custom distros, like using dash dash mount to run a custom uh, VHD, like import any VHD into WSL, uh, export and import to Im like manage your own distros. So you can run multiple versions of Ubuntu very easily, uh, have your own sandboxes, etc. So I want to show some more demos of what that would actually look like when you get to use it. So I am running in my cloud dev box the latest version of WSL. And I, what a typical workflow might look like for that is I can go here and I'm going to CD into my dev folder. And let's just make the, the font bigger so everyone can see it. Uh, but I can CD into my dev folder and then I can from there, interact with my files however I like. Excuse me while I mess around with this. There we go. Let's make that 32. All right, that's much better. OK, great. So I'm in my dev folder. I have some different files in here. Uh, I'm going to go first to my CPP test folder. So this is where I am running some fun C++. And I'm going to run code dot. So code is Visual Studio Code. When I ran code dot, you will see Visual Studio Code opening. But this is interesting. It is opening as a Windows process. However, I can go and access everything that is a Linux file inside of here. So I'm going to put the mic down while I make this a little bit larger. Oh, yeah, OK. Hello. Ah, thank you very much. OK, so here is some fun C++. 
And the key parts here, when I hover over this main.cpp, it's so tiny you can't see it, but you'll have to believe me that it has forward slashes in it. This is a real Linux file that I'm interacting with. And if you don't believe me, there is WSL Ubuntu on the bottom left, which really proves that yes, this is Linux that I'm interacting with, and this is the equivalent of a Linux IDE. If I hit the terminal window in, in Visual Studio Code, I get my Linux shell prompt. And I can go ahead and run this just as I would any other file. So if I hit F5, uh, it will execute this. It will run, and I get a debugger. And I can go ahead and go to my terminal, and let's put in some coefficients because we're going to obviously solve uh, the quadratic formula with the CPP file. And I can hit my breakpoints in here, and I can debug using all the same tools that I would here. So what's really powerful about this is this is a blurred lines application. It's kind of hard to say what is Linux, what isn't Linux, what's Windows, and that's kind of where we like to be on the WSL team because we want it to be, hey, this runs in Linux in the cloud. I want to use Linux to do that. I'm using a Windows machine. Okay, it just works. And I can just use whatever I'm most comfortable with to make that possible. So I can go ahead and debug and use this just as I would any other um, application on my machine. What's really cool about this as well is it plays really nice with containers. So because, like I showed in that architecture diagram, WSL is almost like a container. We're separating everything by namespaces and starting them up. It's, it's very similar in architecture to a, a container. And so the Visual Studio Code team has also added support for this remote experience to containers that run inside of WSL. So it's very possible for you to create your own container definition here and launch this exact dev environment inside a specific container. So you can containerize your different dev environments and use them wherever you want. Um, so let's jump out of this and show another example, which is also pretty similar. But I'm going to go one up, and then I have a, a view shopping cart test. So this one is, is probably a bit more exciting uh, and a little more visual, because we're going to be building a shopping cart using view for any web developers here. So I have access to my folder. Again, this is all running in Linux. And you can see it's saying, hey, you have a dev container definition here. Do you want to install it? Let's, let's do that, and we'll try it. It'll be fun. But uh, we'll see what it looks like when running locally. So it's telling me, hey, you can run this in a container. That's great. Let's run it locally first. So I believe it's npm run serve. There we go. So I'm going to start my, my server for this, my development server. And if you've ever used a VM before, you go, oh, OK, this will be fun. You're using a development server in a VM somewhere. And now it's going to be really interesting to go find the IP and go play with it. What's nice about WSL is I can just go click this local host, and I get it right away. So it's all running actually using local host um, on my Windows machine. So everything to the point of feels just like one application. So I can go ahead and debug this. And what's really nice is if this is my website and it's running in Linux in the cloud, then I obviously am perfectly emulating my environment here. And so that's really neat, but it also plays really well with containers. So let's go ahead and use containers. I'm going to open up Docker Desktop and run that here. And while that's starting up, we're going to take a peek at the container definition under .dev container. And so you can see that essentially this dev container says, hey, I'm going to create a Node.js container. I'm going to set some specific settings, like I want it to run with Vue, and I want my display to work, and uh, I'm going to go and set it up. And so now that Docker desktop is started, uh, we can go ahead and reopen this in a container. So I can type in reopen. And what's going to happen is it's going to grab the container, so in this case a node version of a container. It's going to have whatever definitions and stuff that I have set up in it that I would want. And it's going to build it on my machine. And then this is all within WSL. It's going to build it. It's going to put the VS Code server inside of that. And then it's going to put me inside of that container so I can develop using it. What's really powerful about this is there are other tools, like if you've heard of GitHub Code Spaces, that use this 
that you can benefit from. And so GitHub Code Spaces is a way for you to, for any given GitHub project, open it in your browser and directly get access. Which is really powerful because if somebody wants to contribute to your project for the first time, most of the time the hardest part is just getting it running the first time. Like getting to be able to build can be a, a challenging task. If you can ship a container definition that gets them right away to building, to using your application and immediately being able to contribute, it can add a huge amount of productivity to your projects. And so this is using the exact same definitions. It's actually the exact same um, plug and play model, the exact same YAML files. And that's why I have it included in this project because I can use it locally with WSL and get that environment right away, that Linux environment, or I can use it online or anyone else in the project can use it. So if you git clone this, uh, you can use it right away. And so uh, it seems to be just finishing up, but there we go. So now it is doing the last bits of npm install, but we can poke around the project now and you can see, hey, all of my files are here and I'm running in a container now at the end of the day. And so um, the nice part is this is containerized and shareable. Okay. I think we're finally ready once everything is done being installed. Um, and the last thing that I'll talk about while this is loading is if you haven't seen Docker Desktop and its integration with WSL, it's another area that we've added uh, to make life easier for using Linux workflows. Here I have that container that we just made, and so it has a great name. Um, it's running on my Windows Docker Desktop.exe, but everything in here on the back end is using WSL at the end of the day. So it's finished. Now I can go and start up my project, and I can just run npm run serve, and it works exactly the same. So it goes, hey, we found a browser window for you. Here you are in localhost. And so I can take this container definition, and that was literally, I never run this on my, on my machine before, like that container. That's how long it takes to get started from scratch to being able to run this website or this project. So you could ship this and anyone could use it. Anyone on Windows or Linux uh, would be able to run it right away, which is really quite powerful. Okay, let's jump back to the slides. So we talked about some of the recent additions that we're, we've added. What are we working on next? So what is next on our radar? Uh, the first one is we want to make systemd support become default for new users. Right now, if you want to use systemd in WSL, we've made it opt-in. And uh, it's a per distro basis. So you basically go into your distro, WSL distro settings and say, yes, I want to use systemd for this distro. We did that because we're messing with people's boot <laughs> and we didn't want to destroy people's WSL distros um, on, on first run. And so what we'd like to do is now that we've put it out into the wild, people are using it and we're getting great feedback, we want to investigate making that the default for any new users and then giving users really good instructions on how to upgrade because it's very easy. The next thing after that is we want to make the store version of WSL the default experience. Right now if you install WSL you get the in Windows version. We want to make it the store version so that you get updates faster. From a user perspective, you won't see any difference from using it. But as people who ship things for users on Linux, what's great about that is now we can deliver updates a lot faster. So if there's something that uh, has a bug in it or something that's broken inside of WSL, we can get an update to users significantly faster and they do not have to revise their Windows version to get that update, which is a huge improvement. After that, we also want to add improved enterprise support. There are lots of enterprises who want to use WSL, but because it's a new piece of technology that uses virtualization, there are some barriers to it uh, that some enterprises have. We want to make ways to reduce those barriers and allow enterprises to safely and securely deploy WSL to all of their developers. And then lastly, uh, performance improvements for networking memory usage and disk speed performance. So we have tons of areas to improve there and we're definitely adding quality uh, performance there. I want to give you a sneak peek of what the system D part looks like here. So I can jump back to my demo. So here I am on my Ubuntu. 
I can go and do sudo vim slash etc slash wsl.conf. This is the settings page for WSL. And so there uh, are two pages, essentially. Uh, this is the distro settings. So in here, I have boot system D equals true. And then if you're on the latest version, the latest store version of WSL, this is all you have to do to add. And now you'll have system D support directly in your distro. So to show you what that looks like, I can go ahead and just delete that and then save this file. And then I'm going to not close this window, but this one. And this is also tiny. Let's make this larger. But I can, so I've closed down my WSL distro. When I close it, we detect that, hey, you stopped using WSL. We wait about a minute to say, you're really done using it. And then we shut down the WSL VM for you. So I can go ahead and run WSL-L-V. This shows what's running. So I'm going to quit Docker Desktop to make sure that I have nothing running in the background. And then I'm going to shut down the WSL VM manually and start it back up again. And then this is kind of like automatically power cycling your machine without wa wanting to wait for it. OK. Great. So now I can just run WSL dash s shutdown. And then that's shut down my WSL distro. And then now this is a cold start. We're going to start Ubuntu back up. Um, so I think we, on average, are about five seconds now with system D enabled. But there we go. So I have access to my prompt. And from here, I can run PS AUX. And I don't have system D running here. And so as a user, if I wanted to update, it's very easy. And I can just add that back to this configuration file. So I can do boot, system D equals true. And now I am good to go and back in the driver's seat. The other cool thing that we can do is managing multiple versions of Ubuntu. Um, and you can use them kind of as playgrounds. So let's say I go here. I don't have a temp folder, but I can make one. So I'm back in PowerShell. I'm going to make a temp folder. And I can go ahead and run things like export Ubuntu to Ubuntu.tar, uh, Ubuntu.vhd, and we'll do dash dash vhd, dash dash vhdx. And I hit a service. Oh, haha. -ha. Because it's in use, I can't use it. But I can close it, and then I can run it. And there we go. So now I can expo export my Ubuntu version. So we're basically, it's the same as a container, packaging it all up, export it. And now I can share this to other people so that they can have my exact WSL instance. And then I can import it back in uh, under different names. So once this export is finished, I can actually import it back in under like Ubuntu Experimental or Ubuntu 2. and play around with a lot of different versions of, of, uh, of Linux in that way. The other cool thing is, while this is happening, I'll split the pane, and I'll show you WSL-L-O. There are a lot of different versions that we have of Ubuntu online that you can install. You can just run WSL space dash dash install. This will install it directly to you as a WSL distro, like Ubuntu 18.04, 20.04, um, as well as other Linux versions like Debian, et cetera. And so it's a really good method for people to play around with um, versions of WSL. And if I hit shift control w I'll close this. So I'm going to just open a new window. But I can go here. So here's that new VHD file. And then I can do something like import in place, Ubuntu 2. Aha. Let's see. I believe that was it. Import in place, aha, distro, then file name. And then dot slash ubuntu.vhdx. Great. And so now when I go ahead and run wsl-l-v, I have Ubuntu 2. And now I have a perfect replica of everything that we just did. And I can go ahead and sandbox this, play around with it as much as I want, which is really, um, really interesting and a really cool use case for people being able to get started with Linux quickly and use it. And so the last demo that I want to show you today before I go over to Q&A is, yes, it still needs the VHDX after you imported it. You can also export it as a tar file. And then you could just throw away the tar file. Because we take the tar file and make a VHDX. But we're literally 
loading that VHDX to, into the VM to create your WSL distro. So the last demo that I want to show is probably one of my favorites. Um, it's Hello World from Linux. And this is just a PowerShell command. OK, that's cool. Um, but what if I did something like Ubuntu and Kause to make a Kause Hello World from Linux? That's neat. And then what if I did again to Ubuntu and I did lolcat to obviously make the Kause Hello World from Linux in cool colors? And then uh, let's change that. I want to also pipe that to Debian. And I'm going to run grep on Linux. And then in one command, we get from Linux, Kause lolcat. So if that didn't dawn on you, we just had a PowerShell output. We piped it into the Debian distro to run grep on that output. That went out back to Windows. Then we piped that to Ubuntu to run uh, Kause and lolcat on it, and then it all went back out to PowerShell. Uh, and that all happened in a second, is how long that took? Yeah, about a second, from cold start for Debian as well. And so these are the kind of experiences we want to give to people. We want to make it really magical. You use it wherever you like, um, and empower people to use the tools where they want it. So as the last part before I go into Q&A, if you want to learn more about the Windows subsystem for Linux, you can. You can follow me on Twitter and ask me any questions you want uh, with my Twitter handle up there, Craig A. Lowen. The WSL documentation is probably the best place to start at aka.io slash WSL docs. Install WSL is just install WSL. And we also have an issue repository on GitHub where you can file issues. And I and the other engineers who work on WSL will look at that and take a look and help you out. Thank you so much for your attention today. Uh, and I'll be looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much, Craig. I think we probably have a lot of questions, so I'd invite you to keep them as ever. Questions, short and clear. So who's got the box to s please stand up with the box in your hand so we can see you and Craig can hear you. Hello, hello. All right. Uh, great talk. Really appreciated it. Um, kind of one question that I had throughout the uh, presentation um, is specifically I'm interested in seeing like is there any future roadmap for like application consumer experience so you could almost think of like oh now that we have systemd support and we can support snaps you know would it be you know conceivable for the idea it's like oh you can go into the Microsoft store and instead of like pulling a package to run on Windows you can pull you know from maybe like the snap store or somewhere else it automatically handles all the WSL setup, and then you know, the client could then just launch the application from like the Windows taskbar. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so as of today, WSL is really geared towards developers specifically. And we've made some choices that make it really great for developers, but might make it a bit harder for scenarios like the question of, hey, can I just package any app and put it to the store and use it? So the, I'll, I'll show you an example of what I mean exactly by that. For a GUI app, if I go back to my desktop, um, you know, when I install stuff, you can see, wow, that's really cool. When I installed a Spotify in Ubuntu just minutes before under Snap, it shows up in my Windows Start menu here, um, right here, uh, with the correct name. But it says Ubuntu beside it, and it has our friend Tux, the Linux penguin, on the bottom right. We made those choices. Because for developers, we want to show, hey, you installed Spotify, but it's in the Ubuntu distro. I also could have Spotify on Windows. We wanted to make sure that they were distinguishable at a glance. And we also added that Tux, the Linux Penguin on the bottom right, to have that same goal of like, oh, I know that this is a Linux app that I'm running, just at a glance. And so those things are great for developing. But they're not necessarily so great for like an application that you might want to run. Because let's say I was shipping my personal app. Now it has always beside it you know, the brackets and always, always has the penguin on the bottom right. It might not be my, the best environment that I'd want for a user, especially if they don't have any concept of what Linux is. So as of right now, our recommendation is still if you want to ship something, either ship it cross-platform or ship it for the store directly. WSL is not yet the best environment for that because of those choices. 
But this is a really common request that we actually have. And so um, we're exploring if there are any op opportunities or avenues for us to field that in the future. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much for the, for the talk. And I think you guys should be really kind of proud of what you've achieved there. It's such amazing technology. So please feed that back to the team, that feedback. Um, the question, though. Uh, you showed a, a kind of workflow for exporting and then re-importing an image under a different name. I was wondering if you have plans on your roadmap for making that kind of like a first-class feature. I think it'd be really cool to have like maybe forks of an Ubuntu-based image, so I could have like a Python one and a Ruby one and a web dev one, like just kind of being able to get that from the drop-down and fork it and have different instances. Is that something you've th thought about at all? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so the question, if, if you didn't hear it, was, hey, is there you know plan to make a first-class feature for forking and, and version control and stuff like that for WSL distros? Um, the answer there is, yes, that would be really cool, and it's on our backlog eventually to do, um, but it might be something that's better for the community to do. And a good example is Raft WSL is a project that's in the Microsoft Store. Raft WSL does allow users to like export and import snapshots via the GUI. They do it via the dash dash import and export commands. Um, but there's also other methods. Like you could have a WSL distro to just run LXD and run containers inside of that, that that then would have diffing on top of them, et cetera. And so we'd love to see the community do it um, and then amplify that it, because it would be something awesome. Um, but it's not something that's something at the top of our priority list right now as we try to tackle other things from a platform level that might be more applicable. Hi, do we know when uh, we'll get proper bridged network adapters so that we can actually run network services? And second question, is there a fix inbound for orphaned GUI windows? Like if I run Firefox, then close the console, and now I've just got a thing I can't make go away? Great question. So bridged mode, <laughs> when is the, the fix for that? Uh, right now, the WSL networking architecture runs under NAT mode, uh, which has its you know, pros and cons. We have an experimental version of bridged mode that very motivated users noticed on GitHub uh, when we created a private version internally. And people went and looked through the strings that were released and went, wow, they added bridged mode. And we're like, well, this is experimental. So it is possible to go play with that to try it now. Um, but really, our plans are we're working with the networking team uh, to take a look at what are the opportunities there. We want to ship one networking mode, if we can, that works best for the majority of users. So right now, in terms of bridged and NAT, we're trying not to have, hey, choose between bridged or NAT when starting WSL. And so we're seeing with the networking team whether there's something better that we can do. So I hope to have more information in the future, um, coupled with the enterprise announcements of this is how we're improving networking in WSL. And then okay. for the orphan, orphan uh, GUIs, yes, we're looking at that bug. So I'll, I will make sure to go back to the team and get a status update and post it to the GitHub thread, wherever it is. Hey, thanks for the talk. It was very nice. And just one question. <laughs> so we can have now uh, uh, Linux on Windows, but it, what is it about the other way around? Are you contributing to the Wine as well? Uh, great question. And no, we're not contributing on the other way around. And frankly, the reason for that is, um, you know, at Microsoft, we all run win the Windows operating system. And I have the, the unique ability in my position at Microsoft to build and use tools from the Windows OS and leverage the Windows OS to do that. And so that's where we're focusing our efforts. Um, so I agree, it would be cool to, to do the other way around as well. Um, but there are a lot of experts who are really keyed in there who would probably be better to have impact than I would be. I understand that uh, MS-DOS 2.0 directory support was copy-paste code from Xenix, which I think was really, really cool, a Unix connection. My question is, uh, what inspired you to use uh, the Plan 9 file server for Windows uh, Linux file share? Oh, great question. So why did we use Plan 9? Um, Plan 9... This might be a disappointing answer. We had the code. <laughs> we already had it. Uh, we used it in other actual parts of Hyper-V implementation. We had this Plan 9 um, code lying around, quote unquote. And what we did is we made it cross-compilable for Linux. 
So it was written for Windows. We made it be able to use it in both Windows and Linux, and then we use that uh, as our uh, file server protocol. Thank is WCL2 uh, or the store version multi-architecture supported? So not just x86, but other architectures like ARM? Sorry, is WCL2 or the store version supported? Is that the question? Yeah, as in, so if I've got a, a Windows and ARM oh, machine or Volterra or whatever, can I yes. just install it? Yes, it's supported on ARM. Um, there are caveats there. So the version of ARM is, is still being improved for Windows. And specifically, we depend on a lot of hypervisor, Hyper-V platform features on the WSL team. Like in that architecture side, we call into the host compute service, right? That host compute service has some feature requests for ARM devices. Some of those being like nested virtualization is not yet possible on ARM. But what's great is you can see Microsoft with like, we just released the Windows Dev Kit, which is like a $600, really cool little piece of hardware that lets you get like a whole dev machine with 32 gigs of RAM running really quickly. Um, we have investments in the ARM space. And so what's really nice, and I already said this point, is as anything that goes to Hyper-V for ARM, we automatically get on WSL, and we can amplify in WSL. So yes, it's supported. There are some features that we're working on, and, and they're being worked on. Else is lightning questions. Hi there, Craig. Uh, forgive me if I missed the, the pertinent point in the demo. I, I did see, didn't I, the Linux VM, or the, the guest, if you like, is actually able to start up a Windows application as well. Yes. How, how exactly did that work? I missed that. So that is done using the kernel module bin format. Um, and so we basically point, hey, if you see a Windows executable, call into the WSL.exe, um, like WSL.exe binary inside of Windows, and then that WSL.exe creates a create process in Windows to do it. Forgive me, just so I'm clear. So within the hypervisor environment, the, the guest running operating system is able to say to Hyper-V, please start this app on my behalf. With, with what level of permission or? Yes, so permissions, permissions in WSL. The, the really quick sentence explanation there is it's the same permission level as running PowerShell.exe. So whatever you can do in Bash, you can do in PowerShell.exe with your Windows level user permissions. So I can't go like sudo rmrf Windows System 32 because I wouldn't have the Windows administrator permissions to do that. I would only have that if I ran the WSL.exe process as an administrator. So you can think of it just as running PowerShell.exe, same security story. Hi. So um, there is a couple of things that now uh, Linux on WSL can do that Linux on hardware can't do, like uh, the official support for DirectX, for example. Um, is there any plan to ensure that uh, people using Linux on Windows and developing applications there that um, these applications will continue to work on uh, Linux on the hardware? And in general, yes. So it's a little harder for us. All right, we're okay. It's a little harder for us on the WSL team specifically to say like, hey, yes, we commit exactly to that because we don't own those necessarily parts, right? We, we wanna support the ecosystem and make it possible. And so in that case of DirectX, we made like a dev DXG device inside of the Linux kernel that can then point to do DirectX stuff for your Windows GPU. And so our goal is to make sure that as part of the open source community, that it's always possible to be built on and meets open source requirements. Um, and we, we would love to see people build on top of it. Thank you for all your questions, but thank you very much, Craig. So please thank Craig. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was, that was, that was, that was, oh, yeah.